We read about this glorious event of the resurrection in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we read there the first 18 verses. John chapter 20. In congregation, this is the sacred word of our God. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in, He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as they For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that that he had said these things to her. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, she was converted from the Hindu religion to the Christian religion in her mid-teens. And she was very happy when she met a young man who was also a Christian. They were married. Soon they had five children together. It was difficult for this man to keep a job. In the 20 years that they had been married, they had moved with the family 13 times. And not just from state to state, country to country, continent to continent. Without any emotion, With no cracking in her voice, no tears in her eyes, she came to my office and told me that her husband had been unfaithful. And unfaithful, not just recently, but every year since the first year they were married. He knew the location of every massage parlor that offered benefits every street corner where women of the evening hung out in every place they had ever lived. And I asked her, how do you keep going? And she looked at me and said, I have put a stone over my heart. I have put a stone over my heart. And I can't help but think as we read this passage for completely different reasons that Mary Magdalene could have said the very same thing. I have put a stone over my heart. There were no feelings, no emotions whatsoever left inside of her. 
We don't know a lot about Mary Magdalene, and we have to be very careful to separate what we do know about Mary from that which we think we know about Mary from our traditions. The Western world, for example, has the tradition that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute before she met Jesus. The Eastern world contends that before meeting Jesus, Mary Magdalene was a high priestess in the temple of the Phoenician gods. There was a book that I read recently or found recently and quickly discarded that claimed that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were married and that before the crucifixion they made their way off to England where he and she are the great, great, great grandparents of King Arthur. That's not true. Mary Magdalene is often identified with the unidentified woman in Luke chapter 7 who anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume. Whether or not that was Mary Magdalene may be true, it might not be true, we simply don't know. But there is one thing we do know that is true. Luke tells us that Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. And we also know without a doubt that Mary was one of the group of women who had come from Galilee to Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion. She saw it all happen. The crowd, goaded on by the priests, crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate, declaring that Jesus was innocent, I find no fault in him, and yet sentencing him to death. That death march where Jesus stumbled and fell underneath the weight of the cross, those nails driven into his hands and his feet, that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the darkness, the earthquake, the death. Mary Magdalene had witnessed it all, emotionless, with no tears left to cry, she had placed a stone over her heart. And she, and Luke tells us some other women came to the tomb, to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. And I'm sure they were discussing how are we going to roll that rock away that's got the seal of the Roman government on it. And as they round the corner, they immediately notice there's, there's something very wrong. That seal's been broken. That stone's been rolled away. And they notice the guards aren't there anymore either. What should they do? Well, while the other women remain behind, Mary Magdalene runs to the upper room and she tells Peter and John, and, and can you hear what, you can almost hear her when she gets there gasping for breath, exclaiming to them, they've taken my Lord away from the tomb and, and we don't know where they've laid him. Apparently, without any further inquiry of Mary, Peter and John make out, in a, out in, a, in a sprint to the tomb. The unnamed disciple in here, we find out from another gospel, is John, and we find out from this gospel that he arrives there first, and unlike Mary, he, he looks inside, and he sees the abandoned strips of linen lying there, and then all of a sudden, Peter's there as well, and true to form, typical of Peter, he just charges boldly right into the tomb, and in addition to those linen strips, Peter's, Peter spots that, that burial cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, folded neatly just a short distance away. Oh, how very strange indeed. You know, if the Roman soldiers had taken Jesus, or if somebody had stolen the body of Jesus, surely they would have left him wrapped up in his burial clothes. Or if they were in such a big hurry, they wouldn't have taken the time to fold them. 
So after seeing the tomb empty, boys and girls, after seeing the tomb empty, what do you think those disciples did? Verse 10 tells us this. Then the disciples went back to their homes. I find that such a curious verse. And yet, and yet it's really not all that curious because they weren't expecting a resurrection. I mean, think about it. If the followers of Jesus had even the slightest inclination that Jesus Christ was going to rise up from the dead, even though he had told them that several times, if they had any hope whatsoever, they would have set up some kind of vigil around the tomb waiting for him to come out. But now they come to the tomb and they find it in empty and they say, well, that's interesting. And then they go home. By this time, Mary has returned to the tomb and I wonder if we can identify here a little bit with Mary Magdalene. She has seen the person whom she loves the most in this life, the person who she cared for and the person who cared for her, the person who had cast seven demons out of her. She had seen him brutally, horribly executed. And now, now she comes to the tomb of the one she loves and it's empty. She had run all the way back to tell Peter and John, and now she's back at the tomb once more. This is the third time she's made that trip. And all the other women are gone. Peter and John are gone. And the body of the one she loves is gone. She bursts into tears. What more can they possibly do to humiliate the one whom she loves? What are they going to do? Now start parading his body all over the city of Jerusalem? Perhaps because he died so quickly, maybe, maybe they're going to put him back on the cross because he had to be moved and taken down because of the Passover. Now that Passover's done, they'll put him back on. That really wasn't all that unusual. When Andrew was crucified, he was left on the cross for two days. Maybe they took his body out of the tomb and, and cast it into the garbage heap outside of Jerusalem. That's what they did with most criminals. Well, finally, she works up enough courage to look inside. And she sees it's not really empty. It's not really empty. There, there she sees two angels we read, whom she assumes are men, all dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been just a few nights ago when she was there at the burial with Joseph of Arimathea. And they ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? And not understanding any better than her male colleagues, she says, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have lain him. And then she sees Jesus. She sees Jesus. But she doesn't recognize him. Because let's face it, she's not expecting to see him. Do you ever have that? I've had that. Not that long ago, I was having coffee in South Holland, not too far from here, with a few, uh, few, fellow, uh, few friends. And in walks this, this man with his wife, and he says, Hi, Reverend Ord. I had absolutely no idea who he was. But he was someone that I knew who lived in Alberta, Canada. If I had seen him in Alberta, Canada, I would have known exactly who he was, called him, called his wife by name, how are your children, called them by name, but he wasn't where he was supposed to be, so I didn't recognize him. Well, Jesus certainly wasn't where Mary expected him to be. He's supposed to be in the tomb. He's supposed to be dead. And so he asks, woman, why are you weeping? And assuming she's the gar that he's the gardener, 
She gives the exact same reply. Sir, if you have taken him, tell me where he is and, and I'll take him. And then everything changed. Everything. Now let me ask you, what actually changed Mary? It wasn't the empty tomb. It wasn't the angels in the tomb. It wasn't even Jesus standing right there beside her. She misunderstood all of that. There's one word, one word that changed Mary. And that was when Jesus called her by name, Mary. And she responds, Rabboni, teacher, she supposed him to be the gardener, but now, just as the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd, having had her name spoken, she recognizes this is him. This is Jesus. And at that moment, Mary experiences her own resurrection. For Mary Magdalene, that, that stone that was over her heart had been rolled away. Her faith, once severely tried and tested, now, now comes leaping forth. Her hope, dashed asunder by events of that Friday, are now rekindled as she gathers around her master. And she can understand what Paul would write years later, that which were uh, that which was our, our call to worship, our hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, perhaps you are here today in response to some invitation that you have received or perhaps you're watching because... You're at somebody's house and they thought, hey, let's watch this. Maybe you're a member of this church and you feel like you should be here because, you know, it's, it's Easter. You should be here in church. And, but the reality is you've lost all hope. Your faith has been tested by some trial that, that you're going through and it weighs heavy on your heart, heavy on your mind. And you have trouble just getting through the day and you've placed a stone over your heart. Maybe you're being held captive by, by sin. There's this addiction that you just can't shake. Try and try and try as you might. And you've been to the cross, and you've laid your burden there, but you've left in darkness. Somehow as you leave the cross, you find out, I still have this burden and you just can't seem to shake it. And yes, you believe Jesus died on the cross along with everyone else when, when we say the Apostles' Creed, you're right there saying, yes, he was crucified, dead, and buried, and you even acknowledge, yes, he rose again on the third day, but the significance of it hasn't hit you between the eyes because they're so full of tears. Well, instead of looking at the cross, Instead of looking at the tomb, significant as they are, you need to look to Jesus. You need to listen to Jesus. Why are you weeping? And then tell him. Tell him. And then listen as he says the most important word that you will ever hear. Mary. Only not Mary. Your name. Your name. You see, the significant thing for Mary on that day was not the empty tomb. It wasn't the angels, and it wasn't even her love for Jesus, but it's the significant thing is Jesus' love for her. It's the love of Jesus, love enough to come to a weeping, hurting sinner and call her by name. Hundreds of years earlier, a prophet by the name of Isaiah 
says in Isaiah 43. He says, this is what God says. This is what God says, who created you, who formed you from the dust. And he says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I have called you by name. You are mine. God says that. I find those verses so amazing. The, the God who is infinitely larger than this universe. The God who spoke and light came out of his mouth at 186,282 miles per second and filled the darkness of this world. The God who knows every star by name. Ever go out in the middle of the night and it's a clear night and you see all the stars and, and somebody says, go ahead, count them. God knows every one of them by name. He knows your name, too. He knows your name. And just like he filled the darkness and the chaos of this world with light and with order, so also he can fill the darkness and the chaos of your life with light and with order. Because he loves you. Because he loves you in spite of your addiction, in spite of your burden, in spite of that weak faith, in spite of the fact that you may even have given up hope. He loves you so much. God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, loves you so much that he sent God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, into this world, and he has taken upon himself your burden. He died. As we saw on Good Friday, he died for us. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Rather than risk losing any of his sheep, rather than losing you, the lost, the wandering, the, the disheartened sheep, the good shepherd fought against Satan and face the horror and the agony of hell. And here's the thing. He fought against Satan and won the victory. He faced the horror of hell. He faced death. And then today we celebrate he rose victorious from the grave. The tomb is empty. It's empty. Hallelujah. It's empty. And the one who walked out of that tomb calls you by name. And he says, I will not leave you. I will not abandon you and forsake you. Yes, you're going to go through difficult times because this is a difficult world. And non-Christians and Christians will agree on that. This is a difficult world. There's an old baptism form. I think it came out in the 50s. Maybe some of you were baptized as little babies where, where the words are this world, which is nothing more than a veil of tears. Jesus says, yes, but I'll be there with you. And I will get you through those difficult times. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus says, but I have overcome the world. That veil, is torn in two. And I know you by name, Jesus says, and I gave my life for you. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? That's an amazing verse. I mean, Paul says, look, that all-powerful, light-breathing God gave his son to die for you. That's how much he loves you. The all-powerful, light-breathing God. He didn't have to do that, but he did. And if he's willing to do that, if he's willing to give his son for you, how much more will he give? 
How much easier is it to give you whatever you stand in need of? He will go through whatever heartache you are going through with you right now. And all you need to do is listen. Listen to him as he calls your name. And then respond the same way Mary Magdalene did. Worship him and adore him. Amen. Our Father in heaven, how amazing it is, how amazing it is that you know each one of us by name and that you love us enough to send your Son into this world so that all who call upon his name, all who recognize him as he calls us by name, can understand and know his great love and can understand the victory that he has won for us through his death on the cross. Oh, Father, you, Paul was so right when he wrote, Our hope does not disappoint, for shown to us this day is how great your love is. We praise you and we glorify you, and may we do so now and forever in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.